So Prabhupada took birth in this world 119 years ago. And he actually gave an ideal example of all four Vedic ashramas. He was a very responsible and, and dedicated uh, father and husband. Actually, first we should begin in his youth. He was, he led a sinless youth and worshipped Krishna practically from birth, then his household or life. Then he uh, took Vana Prasta. Unfortunately, or fortunately, his wife uh, was not enthusiastic to participate in this new adventure. And then finally Prabhupada took sannyas at the order of his guru who appeared to him in a dream. Prabhupada used to laugh and say that his spiritual master began to appear to him in dreams and tell him to take sannyas. Prabhupada said, I was horrified. Of course, he would also laugh. And then in 1959, he did take sannyas. And in a sense, the rest is history. Prabhupada was compassionate even in Grihastha life. Uh, he took sannyas at the age of 63, even though he taught in his books that one can take sannyas at the age of 50. So we see that even in his family life, he tried very hard to include his family in his missionary work. So, even before Prabhupada came to the West, we see him experimenting, trying different strategies to spread Krishna consciousness. He went to Jansi and began the League of Devotees. Of course, I'm sure he took the name from the League of Nations formed after World War I. Uh, but that did not work out. There was one lady of high society that took away his building. So Prabhupada didn't stay in Jansi. He thought, if that doesn't work, I'll try something else. So he went to Delhi and began writing and distributing his little back to Godhead. But again, he saw that uh, there were some nice results. There were some nice anecdotes of favorable people, uh, but it was not leading to a powerful Hare Krishna movement. So on the advice of a friend, he went to Vrindavan to write books. Uh, and then he came to the West. On the day that I took sannyas, uh, I, I was in Prabhupada's room, and Prabhupada was telling me about his arrival in America. He said, when I got off the boat, I didn't know whether I should turn left or right. But I was not afraid. My confidence was that I had brought my books. He brought 600 books, 200 each of the three-volume first canto. So Prabhupada then went to Butler, Pennsylvania, and... Uh, he thought he would begin there. So the good news is that he had reached America in Butler, Pennsylvania. The bad news was that he was in Butler, Pennsylvania, which is a relatively small city. Actually, it's not even relatively small, it's just a small city. Although it's a very nice city. And I have a nice disciple from Butler, Pennsylvania. Still, Prabhupada went to New York and he began to sell his books in bookstores and to live a precarious life. So he met Dr. Mishra, who uh, was giving, should I put it, sort of, sort of, more or less spiritual teachings. Prabhupada tried to work with him, but that didn't work. So he somehow got a little place and began his own matchless gift center. So Prabhupada could have just stayed in New York. Of course, he had to leave for a little, a little while to Montreal because he lost his American visa. But he began to travel. He opened the center in San Francisco, and then Los Angeles, and then many centers began to open. 
In 1970, Prabhupada took his movement back to India. And uh, it was a huge success. But he noticed that people were misunderstanding the Harinam Sankirtan in the street. They thought the devotees were professional beggars. So for a while he stopped the Harinam in India. So in Prabhupada's life, we see him constantly responding to changing conditions and always focused on uh, making his guru's mission a success. So now we are in the year 2015. And uh, of course in Lithuania, uh, small country, but uh, full of Shakti. So uh, it's amazing to see so many devotees here in other parts of the world, such as the Western world, uh, it's a very different situation. <clears throat> uh, some people complain that I talk about Krishna in the West. No one in Lithuania complains. But they say, why do you talk about Krishna West? We could ask the same question to Prabhupada, why he put the word West in his Pranam mantra. Nirvishesha shunyavari paschaktya deshatarine. Prabhupada could have put in his pranam mantra, Savior of North, South, East, and West. But he understood that in order to actually change the world, uh, it was necessary to establish powerful movement in the West. So if the West could only follow Lithuania, there, there'd be no problem. <laughs> what? The biggest river is Namuna. Namuna. Prabhupada, uh, I was fortunate to. I was fortunate to have a. Uh, in my relationship with Prabhupada. I first, as I explained yesterday, I first saw him in 1969 at a program at my university. And uh, then I saw him the second time for my initiation about a year later. In those days, Prabhupada would personally perform the fire sacrifice. And he was the ocean of mercy because he, very, he did a very short ritual. <laughs> when Prabhupada first uh, gave permission for a few of his disciples to perform the fire sacrifice, one of the first devotees was Satsvarupa. So many years ago I asked him, what did Prabhupada tell you about the fire sacrifice? And Prabhupada told him, make it shortcut. <laughs> Anyway, so uh, then in, in, um, later in, 19, in 1970, after being initiated, Prabhupada called for me. He said, he said somehow he thought I was intelligent. <laughs> he even told my mother I was very intelligent. <laughs> so, of course, she loved Prabhupada after then. <laughs> so, <clears throat> when I took sannyas in 1972, uh, I was 23 years old. That means in terms of modern physiology, I took sannyas several years before my brain matured. Uh, young men are notorious. Anyway, somehow or other, uh, Prabhupada and Krishna protected me, but when I took sannyas, um, then in a sense my relationship with Prabhupada was different. Um, because he expected more of me, and therefore he gave me more attention. Uh, actually, I'll tell one story how Prabhupada, well, I can't say he humbled me because that would imply that I'm humble now. <laughs> But soon after taking sannyas, I was traveling around America preaching in universities. I was assisted by a brahmachari named Bir Krishna. We were 
We were definitely at least a little crazy, but very sincere. One time we arrived at the University of Oregon, and Bear Krishna went into the administration building, told them that they had found this great yogi in a cave up in the Himalayan mountains, and that they should, the university should give money for that great yogi to speak. And the great yogi was me. He was just waiting right outside the building in the Sankirtan van. So they agreed. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> so a young boy about, I guess about 17 or 18 years old, still in high school, came to our programs and then he joined the movement. Uh, he went to his home to, he lived in a goat shed. So we had to get all his things and then some people almost dragged him out of the movement. I mean, that one day, we had to twice save him from his acquaintances. We finally got him away and drove that night to port away from that town. So he's, he remained a devotee. Today he's known as a Bhakti Vidya Pornaswani. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, the program was going very well, so I went to see Prabhupada in Brooklyn right after that. And when I went in to see Prabhupada, he was very, very pleased to see me. He had just finished a good breakfast and he was in a jovial mood. So he said to me, sort of joking, Oh, Hridayananda Goswami. He said, You are traveling and preaching. I just sit here and eat. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the Prabhupada was very pleased with my program. So naturally I became, I reciprocated by becoming proud of myself. <laughs> so, so later that afternoon I went into Prabhupada's room to get more praise and appreciation. <laughs> And Prabhupada taught me a good lesson. When I entered his room, um, there was a young brahmacharini who was cleaning his room. In terms of ISKCON hierarchy, she was just a young girl. She had no position in ISKCON. But she was cleaning Prabhupada's room with great devotion. So I sat in front of Prabhupada waiting to be appreciated. Prabhupada didn't speak one word to me. He was simply watching this innocent young girl. And so he spoke to her like a loving grandfather. He said, what is your name and how old are you? And I could see he was so pleased with her. So at that moment I realized that, well at that moment that she was actually pleasing Prabhupada and Krishna by her devotion. So Prabhupada, um, at the same time, Prabhupada perfectly reflected Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. At the end of the Gita, Lord Krishna says, Jaidam paramang guyang mad bhakti shabhidhasyati bhakti mai parang krita mamai vaishyati asangshaya nachatasman manusheshu kaschin mei priya krita ma pavita nacha mei bhuyo anya priya taro bhuvi. So Krishna says that um, one who, in the future tense, one who will preach this knowledge among those who care about me. That preacher has done the greatest service and that person will come to me alone. And then Krishna says, it is only that person who is most dear to me in this world and no one will ever be more dear to me in this world. So Prabhupada kept us, well, I can't say kept me humble, but uh, he kept us from becoming too crazy. But at the same time, he gave special attention to the preachers. And Prabhupada especially identified with those who did pioneering work. Because Prabhupada had done that. Prabhupada was um, always conscious of his experience in coming to New York. And when Prabhupada was here, in all, in all the first uh, years of the movement, that New York uh, event was like a uh, was the paradigm for ISKCON uh, to courageously go out and spread the movement even if you have to go alone was sort of the um, it was the guiding light of ISKCON and Prabhupada uh, felt a special solidarity with those who followed his example for example he sent me to Latin America and when the movement grew very quickly, uh, Prabhupada was really delighted. One time I went to visit him in New York, 
and he was so pleased with the results in Latin America. Latin America, yeah. That when I entered, he, had, uh, he said to his servant, give him some Mahaprasadam. And then he said, give him more. So I had uh, arranged a new set of clothes for Prabhupada. So when I gave him that gift, then he gave me a set of his clothes. So there was a special kinship, special solidarity between Prabhupada and those who uh, went out to spread the movement. In those days, the GBC members were those who had shown that courage to go out and actually spread the movement. So if only the whole Western world was just a, uh, a bigger version of Lithuania, we wouldn't have a problem. But unfortunately, for some inconceivable reason, American Western Europe do not follow with. So obviously, they're in Maya. Maya, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, so that's. I. It, it's been actually very inspiring for me to come here to this country, because in the Western world, it's very easy to give up. It's very easy to believe that uh, there will not be a powerful Western Hare Krishna movement. That in fact the Western movement exists in order to provide spiritual services to those who have come from India. With a few little outreach programs to Western people. Some devotees don't see the problem. Uh, a small, irrelevant Western Hare Krishna movement for many has become the new normal. And when people think something is normal, they don't try to change it. But because of my personal association with Prabhupada, and because uh, so many times he emphasized to me uh, the importance of a successful Western Hare Krishna movement, uh, I cannot accept the present situation because I can't imagine that it would please Prabhupada. Many times I sat at Prabhupada's feet at press conferences when he came back to America, and uh, he would point to us sitting there at his feet. And with great happiness and pride in us, he would say to the press, these are American boys and girls. I did not import them from India. Of course, now he would have to say the opposite. This is not a criticism of the great souls who take birth in India and come to Krishna. A Vaishnava is beyond all bodily designations. And it, uh, the Vaishnavas that come from a Hindu background are great souls. And uh, we are all very, very happy that Krishna has brought them. It is not about them. It is about what, what is not happening. When Prabhupada came to my zone in South America in 1975, he received a letter from the GBC of Southern Europe with a big picture of a new chateau new uh, castle. castle. It's more, really more of a palace than, a, than actually a castle. Mm -hmm. he, he, uh, this large building in Geneva. Mm -hmm. In front of the building, many devotees were seated. Prabhupada wrote back to this GBC, this is very nice, but are these local devotees or did you bring them from somewhere else? <laughs> Similarly, when Prabhupada opened the movement in India, he was very anxious to bring Indian devotees to the movement. So Lithuania is such a beautiful example of a successful Hare Krishna movement. But <laughs> but <laughs> and uh, last night I was watching the stage show of very talented singers. And it actually gave me a vision of what the movement could be in the West, in America and Western Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and most important of all, Luxembourg. Luxembourg, yeah. <laughs> actually, compared to Luxembourg, Lithuania is a European giant. <laughs> anyway, uh, so I um, actually ask all of you, who are such sincere servants of Prabhupada, to pray 
for the Western preachers that they have intelligence to present the movement appropriately. Uh, sometimes we think that the result is automatic. Uh, if we just, but actually Prabhupada and Rupa Goswami and Krishna all reject that idea. There's a famous story uh, that comes from Giriraj Swami. Just before Prabhupada left this world, Giriraj went to see Prabhupada in Vrindavan. In the middle of the night, Prabhupada's servant came and woke up Giriraj and told him, Prabhupada wants to see you. Giriraj ran to see Prabhupada, wondering what it could be. He entered Prabhupada's room where there was just one little candle. Finally, Prabhupada called him. Prabhupada was, his body was so weak then that Giriraj had to put his ear next to Prabhupada's lips. Yeah. And Prabhupada asked Giriraj, when I am gone, will this movement continue? And as Giriraj tells this story, yeah. um, he gave sort of the standard company answer. Uh, he said, yes, Prabhupada, the movement will go on if we chant Hare Krishna and follow the rules. But Prabhupada indicated that is not sufficient. He said, there must be intelligence in organization. Rupa Goswami says in the Upadesh Amrita, with the word Niyamagraha, that if we think the results of bhakti are automatic, if I do this, Krishna must do that. Uh, that is something like bhakti mimangsa philosophy. And Rupa Goswami says, Shadvir bhakti vinashiti, that will destroy your devotion. And yet in the Western world, many devotees think that we can go out in the street and we will mechanically save people, even if they are themselves unconscious of the fact that they're being saved. Involuntary liberation. Krishna himself says in chapter 17 of the Gita, verse 28, Ashadhaya hudam dattam tapas taptam kritam chajat asad iti uchate partha nachatat pratyanoya. That any religious activity which is performed without faith gives very little result in this life or the next. So, you are all very, very fortunate that you live in such an amazing country where so many people are attracted to Krishna. Lithuania is like a little East, I don't know what you'd call it, Northeast European Vrindavan. But the situation in the West is very different. I don't think we can say there's a single Western country where the movement has grown in the last 30 years. And most of the Western countries the movement is actually smaller than it was 30 yeah, years ago. And yet Prabhupada defined his central mission as somehow saving the Western countries. Prabhupada told me personally, and he told everyone many times, that ultimately his global strategy requires us to establish a powerful Western Hare Krishna movement. So that's what I am focusing on now at this point in my life. Uh, so you should all pray for us who are trying to find some way to restore Prabhupada's relevance in the Western world. There was a funny movie when I was young called The Mouse That Roared. It was about a, uh, some tiny little country in Central America that was having serious economic problems. And they decided the only way to save their country economically, they had to lose a war to the United States then they would get so much money to rebuild. And so they declared war on the United States. And by, and by some crazy set of circumstances, they actually won. <laughs> so similarly, maybe Lithuania can save America. Anyway, uh, Prabhupada wrote his own Pranam Mantra. And so, uh, Namaste Saraswati Devi. Uh, First, uh, Prabhupada identified as a servant of his spiritual master, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. And Prabhupada also describes himself as Gaudavani Pracharine, which means uh, one who is preaching the message of Gauda, Lord Chaitanya. And Nir Vishesha Shunyavadi Pasyati Desarni. Vishesha in Sanskrit means distinction. So, such as the distinction between God, the soul, and nature. 
So one who does not make this distinction is called nirvishesha. One who thinks the soul is God, or God's body is material, and so on. And then, shun and then shunyavadi, of course, means those who are preaching voidism. So nirvishesha shunyavadi paschatya desha. Paschatya means western. It also means uh, behind. It's funny because um, we find that, for example, in countries like Lithuania or India or Russia or Ukraine, it's easier for people to understand the need to serve a personal God. Whereas in, in America, they have much more important things to do, like waiting for the next iPhone. So anyway, this is a challenge to us. So you, you are very fortunate here that somehow Prabhupada has Krishna, by Krishna's arrangement, you've taken birth in such a, such a beautiful country. So my humble request today is when you chant Hare Krishna and pray to Prabhupada, please uh, pray that somehow Krishna gives us intelligence and strength uh, to do something like this in the West. Prabhupada said, I just saw this quote, Prabhupada said that if you present this movement appropriately, it cannot fail. So if we are failing to spread the movement in a major part of the world, it may be that our presentation is not perfectly appropriate. I don't mean to say it's mundane or offensive. It just may not be very strategic. So, thank you all very much. Yes. Yes. How can, how can we become uh, personifications of mercy of Srila Prabhupada that we could also spread Krishna consciousness? Um, Prabhupada once said, Krishna consciousness is not a bluff. Um, we have to have real Krishna consciousness. And uh, there, it's possible to be selfish even in spiritual life. One can think about one's own spiritual happiness, or even one's own bodily comfort. I have one god brother that went to live in a beautiful tropical beach, and then he uh, tells everyone they have to practice Raghunuga Bhakti. Preferably under a coconut tree. So Prabhupada, when Prabhupada went to New York, it wasn't, he, it's not that he checked the weather in all the different cities and thought, I'll be more comfortable there. He wasn't thinking about where he would be, his body would be comfortable. He didn't know what was going to happen to him. He just knew from a strategic point of view, this is the best thing to do. The Prabhupada said we should execute devotional service as if in military discipline. So, so we have to be really fixed on getting the job done. And the job is to spread this movement. And uh, they say in America, the truth is what works. That sounds like something Americans would say. I wish more American devotees would say it. Anyway, um, at the same time, uh, as we know, a Paramahansa sees everyone engaged in Krishna service. So we may not be Paramahansas, but as we advance, we should feel more and more empathy with non-devotees. So if you consider these two extremes, a neophyte, for a neophyte, every non-devotee is a serious th threat to his spiritual life. Just like parents tell their children, don't take candy from strangers. So for a neophyte devotee, everything the non-devotees do, no, you shouldn't follow that. But as, and then the other extreme is a Paramahansa who sees everyone as Krishna's devotee. So we can tell how much we are advancing by seeing how much empathy we have for non-devotees. To feel real empathy with non-devotees may not be safe for a neophyte, but it's natural for a more advanced devotee. That's why it was, so, it, was, it was very nice to see here in Lithuania, like that beautiful program last night, how you're engaging so many people in serving Krishna. So Prabhupada, in his Pranam Mantra, said, Gauravani Pracharine. So, and Prabhupada, there's a verse spoken by Lord Chaitanya to a Brahmin in South India. Jare dako tare koha Krishna upadesh amar akyai guru hoi tare desh. Whomever you meet, tell them Krishna's message. Prabhupada quotes that verse in the Veda base about 200 times. 
And he explains over and over again what it means to be a guru. Prabhupada emphasizes that the guru speaks infallibly when and only when the guru is repeating Shastra or Krishna. So Prabhupada's infallible message is Gauravani, the message of Lord Chaitanya. But in the details of how to spread Krishna consciousness, there must be the freedom to make relevant and necessary adjustments according to time and place. Prabhupada discusses this in his purport to the Bhagavatam 4.854. Narada Muni tells Dhruva, you should worship Krishna. Desha Kala Vibhagavit. Desha Kala Vibhagavit. Very good. It's the same, it's the same in Lithuania. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which means that you should worship Krishna knowing the distinctions of time and place. So Lithuania in 2015 is a Desha and a Kala. It's a place and a time. And America is another place. So, therefore, to really spread the movement, we have to be intelligent. We have to follow, but not blindly. That was the whole point of Prabhupada's last instruction to one of his dearest disciples, Giri Rajswam. The result is not blind and automatic. We must be intelligent. So those of you who are uh, trying to serve Lord Chaitanya in Lithuania, that's your responsibility. It seems like you're doing it very nicely. Uh, when we look at the West and we see a very different situation, of course the easiest solution is obvious. Blame the non-devotees. And that's a very popular uh, strategy for dealing with the problem. However, I prefer a more active approach. Rather than just blaming non-devotees and waiting for prophecies to be fulfilled. Still, in every country, uh, it is our responsibility to be intelligent. Those who are very intelligent are successful in the Sankirtan movement. So anything else? Yes. What results are we looking for to indicate that we are being successful? Does it mean everybody has to become 100% Krishna conscious? Or as you said, that they are being... No, they just have to give money. <laughs> <laughs> that was a joke. They were you up. Although sometimes the truth is told in jest. Anyway, um, when I used to go into Prabhupada's room, when I was, somehow Krishna was blessing me with a lot of success at GBC of Latin America. As soon as I walked into Prabhupada's room, he would say, so how many temples did you open? How many books distributed? We know that it, you cannot reduce bhakti down to mere numbers. But somehow Prabhupada believed that I was serving with devotion. So Prabhupada gives practical results himself as evidence of his position. For example, there were God brothers of his who very brilliantly criticized him. And Prabhupada said, these fools don't understand how to recognize the Acharya. And then Prabhupada talked about the results he had gotten. So someone may be very sincere and not get big results. But if we want to have that special mercy that Krishna talks about in Bhagavad Gita. And if we want to actually help fulfill Prabhupada's desires, then we should be Krishna conscious. But we have to also pay attention to the results of what we're doing. Otherwise, it's like whimsically cooking for Krishna. Whoops, I burnt the sabji. I forgot to put the sugar in the sweet rice. But that doesn't matter. I cook with love. It's like a mother that forgets to, she, for, she forgets she left her child. Where did I leave my child? She can't remember, but I love my child. I just can't remember where I left her. So, if we know that Krishna wants something very badly, and Prabhupada wants it, then we should try to get it for them. And that requires intelligence. 
not simply mechanical, blind uh, procedures. Someone there? Yes? 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 So Prabhupada, before his leaving uh, this world, he spoke about necessity of Varnashrama and uh, cooperation. Why Prabhupada so much attention put to those uh, secondary things before leaving the world? First of all, uh, it's not secondary because the people don't understand the importance of Brahmins. How will they ever listen to us? And how will they ever stop the capitalists from destroying the world if they don't understand that a Vaisha is third class and has to remain in that position? But there are two major problems with instituting the Varnashram. Actually, the, the ashrams already exist, more or less. There are actually some people, even in the West or even in Lithuania, who uh, believe that uh, they should remain chaste until they're married. It may not be everybody, but the principle still exists. And then there's retired life and, of course... But, but... The real problem is the Varnas. There are, so there are two major problems for us to institute the Varnas. First of all, uh, the Varna system is based on an agrarian economy. Actually, the Varna system existed all over the world, including Europe, uh, before the Industrial Revolution. And Prabhupada indicated the Varnas would come back when the industrial economy collapsed. Ir Prabhupada įsikalbė apie tai, kad Varna sistema atgis po to, kai šitą pramoninę sistemą, jinai sugrius. But it has not collapsed. The other problem is that when Prabhupada wanted to develop the Varnas, he said that now that I've developed the first half of my mission, now I want to do the second half. At least in the Western world, the first half collapsed. For example, if you're building a house, you first build the foundation. But if the foundation blows up, you can't say, never mind, let's just build the walls anyway. You have to go back and redo the foundation. For example, Prabhupada um, at one point had us buy farms. Iskand's great back to the land movement. However, because we were preaching in the cities and hundreds and thousands of people were attracted, so we could provide devotees for the farms, we could provide economic support, and the farms were relevant to a successful preaching movement. That situation no longer exists in the West. So we have to go back and build the foundation again, which is a successful preaching mission. To Western people. Yes. How can we develop, develop our intelligence so that we could see it, uh, the means of preaching according to place and circumstances and time? We either have to be intelligent or listen to intelligent people. If someone says they have an intelligent plan to spread the movement, they should show their own results. It's no use for someone who preaches in the East to tell us what to do in the West. They should come to the West and show, in practice, what they can do. Yes? Uh, so, the question was that if our movement is breaking, like we have found foundation which is breaking in the West, for example, so maybe we uh, can start from building communities like uh, Jews have their kibbutzes, yes. Mormons have their communities, maybe we can uh, consider uh, our foundation those uh, farm communities, agricultural communities, uh, and if our preaching in the cities is failing, maybe we can preach in the countries. Yeah, thank you for that suggestion. Uh, Actually, the movement in the West is not breaking. The sociological point, the movement is fairly strong. It's simply based, most of it is based on uh, preaching to people from the Hindu background. So, apart from that, the movement is all right. As far as the kibbutzim, I actually just spent eight weeks in Israel before coming to Europe. And it's interesting, the kibbutzes have become, most of them have now, some of them are still agriculture, but many of them have now become uh, sort of like collective factories. 
so the reality of the modern world. And of course, because Israel is so small, even the so-called country kibbutzes, they're very close to the cities. So, um, also, when, when you create an alternative economy that is different from the mainstream economy, uh, it's difficult to, um, to prosper because everyone else is doing something else. For example, in uh, everywhere in the developed world, the price of seeds, the price of veterinarians, the price of, let's say, fencing, the price of labor, the price of everything, this cocaine is based on the assumption that you are doing business and killing your animals. So in an agricultural economy, all the prices are based on a, a completely different scale. That's why uh, even in Israel, the kibbutzes have a vital economic relationship with the cities. So if we're trying to create our own Krishna conscious economy, uh, it's essential to also have, be connected to a flourishing preaching mission in the, in the city. Otherwise, the movement is in one sense, it's going well in the West. If you're not particularly concerned about um, saving the Western world. But since that was Prabhupada's main goal and it's in his Pranam Mantra, uh, I am concerned about it. Here's a typical Lithuanian, Chandra Shekhar Acharya. This is typical Lithuanian, Chandra Shekhar Acharya. This is Francis I was wondering if you could speak about um, or develop more in this the topic of, of the pure devotee and the circumstances in which he's in. For example, you were talking about Prabhupada and all the setbacks he had and all the struggles he had. And so are we to understand that these struggles were arranged by Krishna himself? And if so, why would Krishna put a pure devotee into difficulties? And okay. Cool. That makes a better story. <laughs> Just like Prabhupada's coming on the Jaladuta, his heart attacks, it's, it's a great story. Great movements need great stories. I mean, when, when Jesus was crucified, the, his followers decided to more or less put, a, you know, put in, aside for the moment everything he actually taught and just focus on that fact. And so the central narrative of Christianity became something that Jesus actually didn't teach. But that's another story. But they like to tell you a story. So, um, look at the Pandavas. Pandavas. Also, we are in this material world, and Vaishnavas, the Vaishnavas are a minority because this world is for the materialists. Yeah. And so these great stories of the Pandavas or Prabhupada and the Jaladuta, they actually give us strength and courage. Prabhupada was teaching that we're not the body. So if, every, if everything had gone perfectly in his life, health-wise and economically, people could say, well, it's easy for him to preach we're not the body because he has a great life. The Prabhupada revealed Prabhupada's authenticity, his purity, by showing how he responded to difficult situations. Yes? My summoning independently and thoughtful. <laughs> I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> mm. So, how uh, you understood it? Yes. Why? Well, I speak perfect Lithuanian. <laughs> but you can say it in English for it. <laughs> uh, so, uh, she's asking you, uh, you spoke about we should be independently thoughtful, but at the same we have some rules, etiquette and so on, how we should relate. Maybe you can explain this. Uh, how can sure. we relate? Uh, yes. For example, uh, you live in Lithuania, Why? and I assume you're a good citizen. Yes. I assume you're not wanted by the police, or you didn't <laughs> recently escape from prison. So, uh, you're a good citizen of Lithuania. Follow the rules. And, and beyond the laws, you even follow the proper etiquette of being polite and courteous. It's not against the law to be rude, it's just obnoxious. And so a good person not only follows the law, but they even follow the proper customs. And yet, after you do all of that, you have complete freedom to be independently thoughtful. 
Prabhupada came to start a society of Brahmins. Sudras do not become independent because they just get, they, they can't take care of themselves. Whereas a Brahmin will do the right thing voluntarily. So ISKCON is a society. We have laws in ISKCON. And we also have good customs or traditions, for example, Vaishnavitika. So we follow all of that. We cooperate. We respect natural hierarchies. But having done all that, we should have a brain. We should be creative. We should have good ideas. And we should have a culture in ISKCON where good ideas are appreciated and are not seen <clears throat> as a threat. So it's a combination, it's a balance between freedom and social responsibility. If it goes too si far to the side of freedom, we have destructive anarchy. And if it goes too far to the side of don't think, yeah. then we have a society of shudras instead of a society of brahmins. So, as Krishna says in the Gita, it's a question of balance. Time for Abhishek. Oh, one more, this lady here? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Between? Religion fanatic. Between Vaishnava? Who is Vaishnava and religion fanatic? Uh, yes. Re religion. Well, unfortunately, those two categories are sometimes go together. Is that it? Hmm? Yeah. How to feel the line? Because sometimes uh, everyone tries to speak uh, how many friends that we have, but sometimes it's just too much to take. How many? Friends. Oh, principles, rules. Well, imagine my problem with Lithuanian. You think you have a problem with English. So, um, Prabhupada once wrote me a letter in 1972 when I first took sannyas. I told Prabhupada I was going to preach in the universities. And he said to me, please do not present Krishna consciousness as rules. Krishna consciousness is the most sublime philosophy. So, if someone doesn't have a higher taste, how can they follow rules? And if they do have a higher taste, they'll follow the rules in any way. So, preaching means to try to give people a higher taste. For example, if you decide you want to be a concert pianist, and that goal inspires you, then you accept all the discipline, all the rules. But if you're not inspired by that goal, you'll never accept the rules, the discipline. The same is true for someone that wants to be an Olympic athlete or a great scholar. So first we have to inspire people. When people are inspired that I want to be Krishna conscious, then they themselves ask, what can I do? Uh, and as far as uh, fanaticism, there's a, di a definition in the dictionary. It means to claim something beyond your understanding or beyond what is reasonable. So, uh, for example, if I'm ignorant of other religions, for example, I just saw a documentary this morning on, uh, I guess I can say it, uh, Scientology, one of the more glorious contributions that America's made to the world. Of course, it's shrinking because it's, it's I mean, it, it, they, they do terrible things. And so they're interviewing one of, one of, our, one of the great intellectuals of our time, uh, John Travolta. And um, it's bona fide to laugh at my jokes. <laughs> so he was saying that he accepted this particular, he accepted Scientology because there's no other movement in the world that talks about world peace. Solid. And I was thinking, John, you should just keep dancing. <laughs> the same thing, for example, if you take the philosophy of Krishna consciousness, you'll find that a lot of it, probably, you know, most of it, you'll find in other wisdom traditions. Such as, you are not the body. Karma. Karma. The need to surender to God. A personal God. But, what they don't have is Krishna. And that's why Prabhupada said, we, we have to just teach about Krishna. Or, for example, there are some devotees that actually preach that all knowledge comes from India. That means the cure for polio somehow came from India, although no one knows how it did. <laughs> Modern computer technology. So it's a little ridiculous to say that. I mean, obviously, the highest knowledge came because Krishna appeared there. But so if we're, if we're fanatical, 
Or if we think that, for example, I, if I think I personally uh, in, really appreciate Indian culture in terms of music, dance, dress, cuisine. So that's wonderful. But if I say no one is dear to Krishna unless they are immersed in Indian ethnic culture, that's fanaticism. So uh, we have to be reasonable and open-minded. Yeah. And at the same time, we have to strictly follow our own principles. Rupa Goswami gives a list in chapter 6 of the Nectar Devotion of the basic principles of Bhakti Yoga. And it's really unfortunate that he left out of his list some things that a lot, some devotees think are absolutely essential. So if we, we really have to just present a spiritual science. Anyway, there's room. I mean, ISKCON is meant for everyone. And uh, there are different kinds of devotees. But if every devotee is faithful to Prabhupada, following our principles and accepts Krishna as everything, uh, then they're one of us. There are no ethnic requirements to love Krishna. Just spiritual requirements. So, uh, I think last... Uh, <laughs> last question? <laughs> what? Do we have to end? Okay, last... I, uh, the last, last. Last, last, last question. Last, this last, is really last. the last question. So, as soon as, as soon as this... We'll, I'll give you a very short answer, and this, this is really the last one. <laughs> Yesterday you spoke a lot about reciprocation. Yes. Reciprocation of love between one another and uh, devotee and Krishna. Yes. And she liked this presentation a lot and she wants to ask you, maybe you can expand a little bit about it. Yes, uh, see me <laughs> after the class. <laughs> yeah, actually, it's, it's a very good point. And there's also a devotee back there that you wanted to ask a question. So anyone that didn't get their question answered, um, Please have one major credit card, and you can meet me after the. Thank you. So, but I, I can talk to you after the. That's, that's so, thank you all very much. Thank you to the translator.